fired up already. They've fired up already. And uh, one of the commercials that kind of caught my attention was a commercial in which they're uh, espousing the benefits of hooking up your smart appliance. But uh, the, what, part of the commercial was there was a lady w with a whole bunch of, uh, of bags of groceries in her hands and stuff like that, struggling to come in the door, and she kicks the door shut, and she says, Alexa, set the oven temperature to 350. And this is the commercial, like, just like wow, this is great. And I was, do we ever stop and think? How have we gotten to the point in our society where we can't put a grocery bag down and walk to the oven and turn the oven on? It takes about five seconds, maybe, to do that. And somehow this device is going to save us in our harried, overwhelmed existence that we call life. I don't know how many, no, I know there's a few of you here that uh, can remember commercials back from 1978. There's a few of you here that can do that. Some of them you can't. But remember the commercial from 1978 of O.J. Simpson running through the airport. He's all dressed up in a suit, and he's got a briefcase in his hand. He's hurtling things as he's running through the airport and doing all that. And he, he runs up and rushes up to the Hertz rent-a-car count, uh, counter, and they have his papers all ready for him all ready to go out and get his rental car. And the message that was being sent from, from that, uh, that commercial was, success looks like that. You're so busy that you have to sprint through the airport to get to the rental, rental car uh, counter. And then if you can save a few seconds there, Hertz is your friend because your life is so busy. So we're at the point in our, in, our, uh, in our life, many of us as Americans, where our schedule runs our life instead of the other way around. Instead of us having control of our schedule, the schedule is running our life. What must I do next? Where must I be next? What has to happen next? And, and we're just kind of overwhelmed. Uh, you know, people can't even imagine adding one more thing to the schedule. So in the midst of that, what value is there of going to church when our schedules are already packed? We're already full of all kinds of stuff. Sunday morning might be the only opportunity some people have to sleep in. Sunday morning might be the only opportunity to kind of relieve some stress. It can just add another stressor to your life to roust all the kids up from sleeping, get them up, feed them some breakfast, make them look church appropriate, whatever that means, and then get everybody in the car, and then because you're all stressed out, you have an argument on the way to church. Does this ever happen to any other family? <laughs> argument on the way to church? So all these things can occur in our busy life. I'll say this, if gathering together with others in worship is just another thing on our busy schedules, it will always disappoint. It will always fail to live up to any expectations that we might have. God said, Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Sabbath means rest. God knows that we need rest. God knows that we need a quiet time in our life for our spirit to be re-energized. We need a time of communion with our creator. He knows that. It's not some burden he's placed on it. He knows that. That's what we need to function in the grind of life. And when we enter that rest, it centers the rest of our life. And to keep it holy means to have it set apart in our life. That this is something that is that's just not another thing to do. It is set apart as holy, as precious. But that Sabbath, that rest, 
comes not through our own efforts, not through our own scheduling, if you will, um, but through what God has done for us. The Bible and the inspired, uh, inspired words of the book of Hebrews says this in verse 19 of chapter 10. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and the living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. There is so much packed into those few verses of this beautiful imagery of what God has done for us. So few of the things that God, what God has done for us, we can enter into his presence through the blood of Jesus. Because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross, because of what he has done for you personally on the cross, for me, for all of us, we have peace with God. We have a Sabbath with God. We have a rest with God. We can be in his presence. And the fle- he goes on to say that the flesh, that is his, the curtain that is his flesh, that we can have a not only peace with God, but an intimate, personal relationship with the God of the universe. So he uses this imagery of the temple with the curtain in the temple which separated the holy place from the holy of holies. No one could enter into the holy of holies except for the high priest and then once a year on the day of atonement. You remember what happened to the temple curtain when Jesus cried out, it is finished. The temple curtain was torn in two. That barrier that stood there is removed so that now through the flesh of Jesus for what he has done for you on the cross, you can now enter into the very presence of God. You don't have to have some intermediary. You don't have to have some special day, one day of the year. You have access to the very creator of the universe in a very personal way. You can go into the very holy of holies. In God's presence. That's what he's done for us. Third thing is that um, when he's talking about this in verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Faith is what grasps hold of these promises of what God has done for you in Christ. Faith is what grabs this and says, yes, I believe God has done this for me. Yes, I believe that Uh, He has removed this barrier that I can be in his presence all because of what Christ has done for me as he shed his blood for me on the cross. And the fourth thing that that we see done here is, as it goes on in verse 22, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So this beautiful imagery of what God has done for us in our baptism where we have been adopted in his very family that he has washed our sins away, has separated them as far as the east is from the west, and buried them, no longer to be brought up. That's what he's done for you. And he says, I am placing my name on you. You are my child. I've adopted you into my family. I have you. And nothing can separate you from the love that I have for you. That's what he's done for you. He's done all of this for all of us in and through Christ. So gathering together in worship reminds us in the midst of our busy, overwhelmed existence of the rest, the peace that is ours in Christ. And so we gather together, we sing, we we praise him together, we hear what his will is his purpose for our life, and his promises through his word. We receive his body and his blood for the forgiveness of our sins, and we in communion with him and in communion with each other. We're united. We're bound together in Christ. But there's even more precious gems to be mined in gathering together as a body of believers in Jesus, as a 
body of followers of Jesus Christ. So my wife, Stacy, she grew up in the, in the Catholic Church, and um, when we were first kind of uh, dating, we'd sometimes we'd go to Johnstown, I was in Johnstown, and we'd go to the Catholic Church, and I wasn't much of a Jesus follower back then, I was kind of a Brian follower. You ever, ever do that in your life? <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, I w- I'd go along go to, and go to Mass. And, and um, what I noticed is, uh, and even back then when I, I really wasn't a Jesus follower, it's just like people were just coming in here, going through the motions, and then leaving. They'd come in, not talk to each other, sit down, go through the Mass, and maybe even before the Mass was over, in other words, they received communion, and I noticed some people would just, instead of walking back to their seat, they'd just keep on walking right out the door. So no one was talking to each other. At the beginning of the service, before the service, after the service, no one would talk to each other. And I was thinking to myself, there's something that's not quite right about that. I was clueless myself, but I thought that's just not what's meant to be. Uh, there's just, it's just kind of this ritual, this obligation, if you will, that people go through. So Catholic or Protestant, there are many people who treat church as some act, some duty to be performed in their life, another thing on the schedule, something to be done out of habit, something to be done out of obligation, because that's what we do. It is something, so they think, to be lived out privately. This is my own personal thing. But for the most part, as people are doing that, that leaves them empty. There is no depth to that. There's nothing pulling, nothing to pull them back. There's nothing to a value, really. And again, you know, in that view, the church becomes of little value in our life. Uh, For others who have experienced the joy of a relationship, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, with their Savior, there is a desire to share that joy with others. And they also are self-aware enough to know that they're not going to make it through this life without the help and encouragement and support of others who have the joy of knowing Jesus as their Savior as well. And so they know that if they're going through this this world, they need encouragement in the midst of everything that's going on. Faith is meant to be lived out in community. Meant to be lived out in community. So verse 23 talks, talks about this, where it says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. So the writer is saying, let's hold on to this confession. And, and, and this is just, it's a confession of hope without wavering. Guess what? I've wavered at times in my life. And I think we know this as, as parents. Uh, we need somebody else sometimes. When we're trying to do this job called parenting, that's why you're supposed to have a mother and a father in the midst of of parenting, because sometimes one of us is toast, and the other one needs to stand up and take the the reins for a while. And the same can happen in in our own faith walk. We can at times become discouraged, and at times our, our, our hope is kind of dim. It's wavering, and we need each other at that point. So the Holy Spirit... The inspired words go on to say this in verses uh, 24 and 25. So as we're supposed to hold fast our confession of our hope without wavering. And then he says this, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So as we live this life together, as we live this life in community together, we're stirring one another up in good works that God has prepared in advance for us to do. 
And as we do that, it gives us hope. Because let's admit it, at times, it's a little bit overwhelming. You're bombarded with the news, the latest national news, the latest international news. But not only that, you're bombarded with the news that only you know about. It's kind of your own personal news that's kind of hitting you wherever you're at at this moment. And hope can dim. But when faith is lived out in community, when faith is lived out together, encouraging one another, another in community, we see the world differently. differently. That in the midst of that, there's hope. In the midst of that, there's caring. In the midst of that, there's love to sustain us through those times. As the Apostle Paul wrote uh, in Corinthians uh, chapter 13, 1 Corinthians 13, these three things remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. And when you know you're loved by God, and you know that you're in a community that cares for you and loves you, that strengthens your faith, and hope remains in the midst of the storms of life. So we continue to gather, so we continue to gather together because here we are reminded of God's love, His Sabbath, His rest that He's given to you. And here we encourage and spur one another on to not give up, but to love and to continue to do do good works. And this is not something that is just one more thing on our busy schedules, not just one more thing on our plate. It becomes the center of our life, central to our life, whether in this building or outside of this building. Because, folks, this building is not the church. You're the church. You are the church. You are the people of hope. You are the people that bring this hope out of these walls of this building to the community around us. That's the hope that we have that's found in Jesus Christ. That's the hope that we share with each other that's found in Christ. That's the encouragement that we can give each other uh, that's found in, in Jesus Christ. The hope of the world is the church when it's lived out in community in that way. I just want to end with uh, one quick thing. Um, last December, um, Stacy and I had decided to have an open house uh, uh, in, in our house to invite the neighborhood so the neighbors could get to know each other. And we just had finger foods and some people brought some stuff to share as well. And the neighbors loved that. They, some, of the, some of the neighbors, uh, they'd lived there since the one I think lived there since 1970 in the neighborhood. That was the first time they gathered together with other neighbors. Uh, and so they were like, this is great. But no one else you know, kind of took the step to do that. So we're, we're having that again this December. Uh, we put together an invitation. And I just wanted to share this with you. I think communities, neighborhoods are hungering for a sense of community. They're, hung- they're just, no one's taking the initial step. So we as the body of Christ can take that initial step. And uh, if you want, I can share with you, if you're interested in this, our invitation that we have. I can share with you as a Word document, and all you'd have to do is remove our name and remove our email address and put your name on and your email address on it and, and your location and the time uh, if you want to have just an open house in December. This is a great time to get to know your neighbors and to share the hope that we have in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So let's pray. Father, we're thankful for all that you've done for us in and through Jesus. We're thankful for your amazing grace. We're thankful for your patience with us, your long-suffering with us. And uh, Lord God, I just ask that uh, you would fill our hearts with joy and that we, as the body of Christ, would continue to encourage each other, to love each other, um, that this isn't just one more thing on the schedule or overwhelming schedules but it is, uh, it is you who have done this, who have given us Sabbath rest, who have given us peace with you. And Lord God, by the power of your spirit, the joy that you've placed in our hearts, that we would encourage one another, love one another, as you have loved us in Jesus, and in through Jesus, our Savior. In his name we pray, amen.
So let's stand and confess our faith. I believe in God. 